you turn to hear God's word as I read and preach from 1 Peter, I hope that you will have that attitude of a child resting in his mother's arms. There's peace, there's rest there. Find that as we depend humbly upon the Lord and on his Savior, Jesus. I'll be preaching from 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 7, begin at the beginning of this chapter, just so you can see the context. Listen to God's word. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not, for, uh, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I wonder if the children have ever played a game called Follow the Leader. Or maybe you as an adult will remember playing a game like this. It goes, it goes something like this, that there is a leader and you follow the leader. And the leader may take you on an enjoyable trip. For instance, if you uh, follow the leader here at our church property, they might walk you out to take a swing on our, uh, at our playground or to, uh, to go around and to notice the different flowers that are growing along the edge of our property. Uh, things like that. Well, following has other forms too, doesn't it? We talk about social media where you might follow someone on Facebook or Instagram. You can also follow different teachers or philosophers. You might adopt their view of life their values, their ethics, their morality. And that could be for good or for ill. We now have a word for some of that. We call those leaders influencers. Well, I hope that you will see how important it is to be aware of who you are following. I hope you see how it is important that you be intentional about following the lead that God gives to us. He does this directly by giving us his spirit and his word. That way we know him and can follow after him. But Jesus has also given leaders to the church. They are leaders that are given as an example they're given with authority to, uh, to make decisions and to help counsel you and to shepherd the flock. I won't preach again my message from verses 1 through 4 from last time, but rather go on to express what Peter does about how those who are being led are called to follow those who do lead. Are called to follow their leaders. But there is definitely a spirit of the age that runs counter to this idea of following others in authority. The spirit of the age teaches that you need to assert your own voice, your own identity, and that you would be independent from everyone else. In that light, is it important for you to hear Peter's words? that God gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself 
before the Lord. I'm going to start with that idea, which is actually the second half of the passage that I'm preaching on. It's where Peter highlights that we are to humble ourselves before the Lord. And I want to start there because if you get this point, it will shape your understanding of really all of the other relationships that Peter has talked about throughout this letter. It will shape the way in which you relate to others in authority around you. And then I'll go back to look at how that applies to your relationship to leaders within the church. Peter quotes from Proverbs chapter 3, and he is following Jesus' teaching when he says, God resists the proud, but gives, hum- gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. God Resists the proud. I can't help but think that Peter here is reflecting on what the scriptures teach from the Old Testament and also engaging with his own story. Pride. This must be the first sin. Adam and Eve in the garden were tempted by the serpent to reject God's authority in their life and to exalt their own independence. It's a sin of pride. To push away the God who had made them, the Lord Almighty who called everything into existence, who came and walked and talked with them graciously in the Garden of Eden, and who covenanted with them. I give you life, abundant life, but do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you do, you will surely die. What did Adam and Eve do? They listened to the serpent, who said, has God really said And they exalted themselves over God's authority, thinking themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now think of Peter. Jesus, the Son of God, stooped down, becoming man to bring salvation to us. He came to offer himself on the cross to satisfy the justice of the Lord. And as he revealed his plan and his purpose, saying to his disciples that he would go to the cross and rise again after three days, what did Peter do? Oh, no, Lord, not so. That won't happen to you. This is Peter speaking to the Lord of glory, the one who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, the one who came to accomplish our salvation. And as Jesus reveals this mind-blowing gift, Peter has the audacity to exalt himself over the words of Jesus Christ. Oh, no, Lord, far be it from you. As you see it in that light, you might understand why Jesus would rebuke Peter in the way that he did. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Not only did Peter arrogantly presume to contradict contradict the Son of God himself, but his arrogance was of the devil. Get behind me, Satan, says Jesus. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Peter relates this then to the church of his day and the church really of all times. He relates it to us. Almighty God has stooped to make himself known to us. 
He has stooped down to save us from our sin and from our foolishness. He has graciously given us godly leaders to serve us. And yet, out of our own foolishness and pride, we exalt ourselves against all others and against God himself. Not so, Lord. I think I know a better way. We push Jesus away in favor of following a path that we think is better. Saying it that way, I hope that you would recognize just how crazy that is. To think that you know better than God. In these verses, there are several important applications that rise right out of the verses. I want to take it phrase by phrase so that you can see how important this is. God resists the proud. Let that sink in just for a minute. God resists the proud. Jesus put it this way, those who are healthy don't need a doctor. I came to save the sick. You might remember that he said this to the Pharisees who thought they were righteous in their own eyes. They were there when Jesus was speaking about sin. They were there when he was talking about the way of salvation as being faith in the Son, that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should have everlasting life. But the Pharisees are like, I don't need that. I'm okay without this Savior. They were proud in their own self-righteousness. God resists the proud. Are you proud? Is a very pointed application. Do you think of yourself as righteous in and of yourself without any need for Jesus? Can you think of a time when you listened to a friend's counsel and they had come to you and you scoff at what they say to you and you resist the correction of, uh, of those older and wiser or maybe even the elders of the church. God resists the proud. But God gives grace to the humble, as the verse goes on. Isn't this the gospel? This is good news that, that God did indeed send his son to save sinners. What can you do? do to deserve God's favor? Well, there isn't anything that you can do. That's why salvation is of grace, because grace is unmerited favor. You have not and you cannot do anything to deserve that grace. Instead, it is a gift from God. You receive it much like you receive any gift, with humility, with humble gratefulness to the one who gives to you. That means that if you find yourselves kicking against God and proudly plugging your ears to his word, to his counsel, to those he has put around you, there is a way of Humility that, that, uh, that will answer that, that sin of pride. A way of humility that gratefully turns to the Lord asking for help. That's what, uh, what uh, Peter does next. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. I want you to know well that the gospel calls you to respond. Is something of an answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. 
Repent of your sins and trust yourself to Jesus. Resist the devil, which will come in verse 9. Resist the devil and his whispering words of your own importance or his accusation that God is unreasonably harsh against you. He is not. That is of the devil. Renounce your own pride, putting it to death by offering yourself to Christ, body and soul. Humble yourself under the mighty of uh, mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. It's amazing how God turns the world upside down. The devil would have you clamor for your own voice to stand up for your own identity so that you would be acknowledged and exalted by everyone else around you. But God says, humble yourself. The devil promises you great things, even the kingdoms of the world, if you'll just bow down to him. But if you do that, all that happens is you remain his slave For all eternity. But God says, I give grace to the humble. Cast your cares upon me is his invitation. For I care for you. In humility you may come to him. Right now in your affliction. And remember this is a letter about persecution. It's a letter about affliction. And it reveals those sins of the heart. It reveals the tendencies that we have to clamor for our own rights and our own identity. To lift ourselves up in pride. Will you then exalt yourself against all comers? Will you be angry against every slight and affliction? Will you accuse God himself in heaven for the predicament and the affliction that you are in? Or will you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God? Will you wait in faith for his tender mercies to be shown? Will you be patient knowing that he will exalt you in due time? God doesn't say when that will be, but he says it will be. You may trust that, for he cares for you. Seeing that basic attitude of humble submission to the Lord will now help you to understand this call that Peter gives of humble submission to your elders. We start from the position of humbling ourselves under the uh, the mighty hand of God. And as you do that, it makes sense that if you are humble under God's hands, that he would also give you grace to live in humility in really the various relationships that you find in your life. This might click then. It might help you to understand what Peter's been saying all throughout this letter. He gives guidance to you as a Christian in your relationship to government. Back in chapter 2, he says, humble yourself, submit to your government. He instructs servants and masters in the way in which they relate. He uses the word submission there again. He gives counsel about the responsibilities of wives and husbands to each other. Also using that word, submission. And he caps it off here in the relationship in the church between elders and the members of the church. And then gives a sweeping statement about the mutual submission that is part of the humility of the Christian life. Mutual submission to one another. Now I've demonstrated today that Peter defines submission in the context of the most important relationship your relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And in submitting to God, we find great freedom. It really is. It's kind of, uh, kind of an ironic 
type of thing that when you submit to God that you find freedom. Our minds have trouble grasping that. Again, I think the spirit of the age says if I submit to anyone that that's a a bad place to be. But God, again, turns the world upside down. When you submit to God, you are genuinely free. And as Peter said in chapter 2 here, that you live as free, yet not as using liberty as a close cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Kind of reaches his arms out broadly as he moves into this longer passage or longer subject about what it's like to submit in the relationships of this world. And from this, I've described submission in this way, the definition by, uh, by Doriani. To submit means to arrange one's life under the authority or guidance of another. We start with God. We submit in love and faith to an almighty God to the authority of the Son, Jesus Christ, empowered by his Spirit. So how does that now guide you in submitting to the elders of the church? Let me continue to use the analogy that Peter has used. He charged the elders, shepherd the flock of God without lording it over them. Now he turns to the members of the congregation, I used the phrase in my last message, follow them as they follow Christ. And here Peter speaks especially to younger people. He says, you younger people, submit to your elders. The context makes it clear that Peter is is not excluding anybody. It means that uh, if you're older, if uh, if you're very young, that he's not talking to you. He's He's speaking uh, broadly and and chooses out younger people as an example. And it gives something of a distinction between the leaders and those being led. But having said that, I also want you to recognize that there's something important for younger people to hear in this admonition, in this, in this passage. Highlights the common temptation for you as a a young man or a young woman to think of those older than you as being stupid. I've said it pretty bluntly, but uh, there are younger people here that that are sitting in a row with their parents. And I want you to recognize that tendency to think of your parents, think of your caregivers as being disconnected, not cool, not really understanding you, and wanting to live your own life. There's part of parenting that is living you to be responsible so that you may make decisions on your own and make decisions in a, in a godly way. God has placed elders in the church for similar reasons. I remind you of that in the first, first four verses. The shepherding of the flock is the responsibility that God has given to the elders. He gives a short and sweet instruction. Shepherd the flock. He gives a similar short and sweet instruction to the members of the congregation. Submit to your elders. And that is a story that is really as old as time for those who are younger to think of those in authority as being out of touch and to throw off, to resist their leadership, and to think that you are wise in and of yourselves. Now, Peter is not saying that 
those who are older are perfect or that elders never sin. That's not the case. Everyone sins, even the elders of the church. But that does not relieve you of this short and sweet command. Submit to your elders. Now, Peter doesn't go on to describe what this looks like practically. We can think of other situations, like being in a country and our submission to our government. We follow them as they follow the Lord, or as God has given a, a government to, uh, to maintain peace. It's demonstrated in the workplace. It's demonstrated in a family. It's demonstrated in the church as well. Follow them as they follow Christ. He does give a broad a category, a broad characterization of this. He says, clothe yourselves with humility. Here you can apply what Peter says about humility before the Lord. You can apply that idea of putting off pride, putting off arrogance, putting off a spirit of selfish independence that demands your own way rather than a spirit of humility, a spirit that follows Christ through those leaders that God has given. I've been using that phrase to describe the, the leadership that Jesus gives, to follow them as they follow Jesus. I also have been using this phrase, that as shepherds they have the responsibility to know and be known. That's a responsibility that is given to them by Jesus. But I want you to pay attention here because knowing and being known is a two-way street. Think about that. Knowing and being known is a two-way street. See, Jesus gives responsibility to the members of the church as well. Responsibility to know and be known by their elders. And here, responsibility to submit, to arrange yourself under the leadership that God has given. Now, this can be difficult, isn't, isn't it? It's difficult because of that spirit of the age that, uh, that is all around us, that tries to throw off authority in all of its different forms. It's hard to practice humility in all of its godliness. That posture says, you have to respect me and affirm all my thoughts and decisions without any questions. It can even be a curse of youth to drive you to do what you want and to not let anyone tell you anything different. Hear what Peter says. God has given you elders to shepherd you. And there's a lot of benefit in that. And so recognize that tendency to resist the authorities that God has given around you. To resist that, that self-satisfied, self-seeking idea that rejects the leaders that God has given you. And what goes for the tendency to reject leaders goes into really all of the relationships of life. So Peter immediately goes on to say, yes, and all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. All of you be submissive to one another. Peter's getting at that sense of humility that is part of the Christian life. Now, care is needed here because some look at this call for mutual submission and elevate it to say that it wipes out all of the other distinctions in life, as if there is no call for you to submit to elders, to submit to government, to submit in workplace or in marriage. God has indeed 
structured society and family and church with those who serve by leading and those who serve by following. There is a mutual idea, a mutual posture of humility that guides all of that. So everyone, no matter your station in life, high or low, whether in authority or under authority, all should be humble. This isn't natural, but think of it this way. Every morning you need to put on clothes. Okay? I I hope even the children will know that. Every morning you have to put on clothes. Every morning you have to put on humility. Every morning. Because the tendency is to go out into the world in pride. Every morning, put on humility. Really is part of human nature, fallen human nature. Going back to that very first sin, is part of our nature to be proud. I'll just close with the words that Peter uses again. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Let's pray. God, today we bow before you in worship, And this worship is part of our humbling ourselves in your sight. We cast ourselves, every care upon you, rather than trying to work it out ourselves, rather than thinking that we might have a better way. Instead, O Lord, may we take comfort knowing that you do indeed care for us and that we can trust you to do what is right and good and glorious. Lord, I pray that within our own congregation, you would be giving us humble servant leaders that would shepherd the flock, that you would be giving all of us an attitude and a posture of humility towards those leaders that you have given to us, and humility in our attitude towards one another. May we clothe ourselves each morning with humility. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Close by singing Psalm 149a. In this psalm, there is an expression of the greatness of God and our dependence upon him. We acknowledge that he is the Lord. He is the maker. We, we are saying You, Lord, are God, and we are not. And I pray that as you sing this, you would humble yourselves under his mighty hand. Let's stand and sing 149a.